So I think actually these um, advocates and advocacy of the users are going to become ever more important. Hello and welcome to a new episode of uh, Engati CX. I'm your host, Imtiaz, and we are really glad to have all of you join us today. On this show today, uh, we talk to a lot of CX and technology experts from around the world. Uh, we explore, uncover, and share fresh insights on creating experiences that your customers will remember and look forward to. Uh, just a quick context about Engati. Engati is the world's leading multilingual, no-code digital customer experience platform, which is available across 14 different channels with about 45,000 solutions deployed across 186 countries in every domain and use case. Engati has also been recognized as a top platform by Inc. Magazine, Tech World, CIO Magazine, and many others. We run the Engati blog, video channel, and the Engati CX podcast, receiving upwards of 400,000 visitors annually. And now for our guest, Murray Grubb heads up the aviation sector and strategic accounts in Oracle to drive digital transformation, user adoption, and acceptance of modern digital services. He's a former elected politician, speaker, panelist, judge, and an industry expert on all forms of digital engagement. But before we dive into our interview with Mr. Murray, don't forget to subscribe to Engati and tap the bell icon to get access to exclusive content from thought leaders like Mr. Murray from around the globe. Uh, welcome, Mr. Murray. Thank you. Thank you for having me. That's quite, quite an introduction. We had to. <laughs> uh, Good stuff. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's uh, dive into the questions. Uh, we did receive a few questions from our viewers, so let's uh, quickly dive in. Okay. Uh, the first question for you, Mr. Murray, uh, how will the aviation industry recover post this pandemic? What major transformation will we see? Good question. How will the aviation industry recover post-pandemic? Well, I think it's unlikely to go back to exactly as it was for, mm. for any sort of short span of time. I think the industry as a whole is changing. Um, and I think the reason for that is because not being able to fly readily for in excess of a year now has made not just a buildup of people's desire to get away and have that, that holiday, that break, that family time, but there's also a lot of trips and things that have not happened as a result, whether that's seeing friends and family or, or weddings, etc. So I think what's going to happen moving forward, we're going to get an explosion of users. As soon as people can fly, they will fly. As soon as the air bridges open and the vaccines take hold, I think we'll get this real kind of boost of people trying to get away. And I think that will then start to plateau and lull out over a kind of six to 12 month period. And then everything will start to gradually build back to where it was. And the reason I say it in that way, where we'll get that initial uh, boost and then it will start to taper off is because I don't think business travel is going to come back anywhere near what it used to be for at least two to three years. So mm -hmm. I think the big transformation you're going to see is engagement and loyalty are going to become far more important. I think that the airlines themselves are going to have to really reestablish personal relationships and, and real kind of partnerships with their, their customers and their users, as well as the aggregators, because it's going to become a buyer's market. You know, if you had lots of loyalty points with one airline, you may not have them anymore. Um, you're going to have to use whoever's going to fly to where you want to go to, when you want to go to. And, you know, there's been so many planes have effectively been moved off fleet. Pilots have been made redundant. Staff have been put on furlough. There's probably going to be far less flights available as well. So the competition for routes will be higher, both in terms of the airlines, but also the passengers themselves. And that will create a resettling effect of the cost of travel. So it will be interesting to see if the airlines buy the business back in to get people flying again, be confident, feel confident, and allow them to become the engagement activists who will broadcast out on their own social platforms to say, 
I flew from here to there with this airline and I had a great experience and I felt really safe and it was really clean and it was a, a COVID friendly way to travel. Mm -hmm. And if that all happens, I think the, the recovery will happen far quicker. Um, mm -hmm. If the airlines have to push the prices up and push them up quite considerably to try and recover lost cost and because just their overall operating cost will be lower, especially if the... Um, um especially if they are having to try and re recover everything at once then i think we'll, we'll we'll see some big changes here okay so i just had one uh, related question so when we talk about airlines and aviation industry it's typically business travel family travel and so on but what about the cargo industry itself uh, do you think um, is there a similar pattern or do you see any differences? So cargo is really that unsung hero, right? Because um, cargo has gone up massively. That's been the saving grace. It's, it's only because of cargo that so many of our airlines have survived. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't see that changing because I think, you know, Shopping, you used to go to the shops to get what you need from different places and, you, and you'd come home. Now you, you buy it online because you've kind of had to over this last year. But because that's been so easy, I don't think people are going to go back to just going to the shops for something to do. You might go to a destination shopping center. You might go somewhere that's got, you know, a huge mall where it's an experience. Or you might go to one of these big outlet villages to get some great bargains but it will be destination-based shopping. I think the routine shopping is going to still continue heavily online. And as a result, there's going to be far more cargo shipping things en masse from areas to distribution hubs and then pushing that out. And obviously, the last mile traffic is still going to um, you know, play to the, the logistics and courier firms uh, and the Royal Mail itself. But yeah, um, I think cargo is going to keep growing. And I actually think it's probably going to grow faster than any other part of airlines. And even as more and more people start flying, I think cargo will continue to grow. Great. Thank you. That was a good insight. Uh, moving on to the next question. How is technology and AI helping the customer experience in the aviation industry? So technology and AI, it's a, it's a bit of a, a, a double-edged sword, really, because Companies, airlines, booking firms, aggregators, travel sites, they all use technology to try and drive down the cost to serve their market and to, to gain insight and, and see you know, the, the customer's behaviours, digital behaviours, what that digital fingerprint, the digital dust that's created of that movement, what it looks like. Um, so all of that is from the company side. As the user, as the buyer of the service, people care less about what technology you're using and more about how easy it is to use. So I think that the technology that's really starting to shape the market is around autonomous engagement. So not just digital self-service or um, marketing, but really personalized environments and in fact actually moving towards hyper personalization so if i've been looking at various different sites on various different brands and different destinations and you can then come up with an offer for example that is relevant to what i've been searching that is timely that fits into my requirements my my budget then that's just great, right? It's just, it, it, it just works. And I, I, I receive that and it, it then is a call to action. So I go on and do something. If I can then navigate your site easily because you've got an AI engine running behind the scenes that says people that have received this advert then do these things. So make sure you shape it this way. And you're using, you know, great AB environment, AB testing environments to make sure it's always streamlined. And then once I'm on, if I do have a question, a query, a concern, if I can either find that in real time through a, a, a dynamic knowledge base, so I can type something in your genie search that maybe directs me somewhere, 
And if I can't get that, it maybe pops up a, a chatbot or, or a digital assistant and it starts to engage with me that way where it's actually giving me really quite good information, whether that's routine and mundane or a bit more complex. And then if it can't give me the answer that I need, it can seamlessly go up to a, a live chat with a person and that can perhaps even become an audio chat or, or a video chat, especially if you're getting things like co-browsing so you can educate people how to use your site because they've probably not used it for 12, 18, 24 months. So I think that's where the technology is going to really help that customer experience because ultimately it's about engaging with your customers on whichever channel they want to engage with you on. It's about giving them access to, to offers, contents and services on the right device at the right time, at the right price point and to the right destinations for them. And all of that needs to, to work harmoniously as one. So the ecosystem that companies now deploy has to be customer focused. It can no longer be, we've got this widget here and we've got this widget here and we've got this new shiny website and we're gonna try and make these old widgets work with it. And we'll do it because that's what's good for us as a company. They now more than ever have to become their own customer and think if every engagement is the first engagement and we need everybody being an advocate for us and saying how easy we were to use, how seamless it felt, how good value it was, and then how safe they felt going through the process. And it was all secure and it was all, you know, the new normal, if you, if you like, worked for them. And they will then tell everyone else. That's how you know the, the technology's worked. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think as you were talking through this, um, I, I did uh, think of a few questions, for example, uh, most often when we talk about AI and technology, it's really mostly in the acquisition phase or the pre-purchase. It it's helping with designing the right um, acquisition mode mm -hmm. uh, for the business to bring the customer in. Uh, do you also think, let's say, in a post-purchase scenario, like a post-travel scenario, uh, do you think we can employ technology and AI to bring in the feedback or to you know, drive loyalty um, that can probably, you know, um, get the customer to travel again. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, if you think the travel industry is split into five sectors or, or, or five steps, if you like. So the first sector is, is research, then it's mm -hmm. booking, then it's pre-flight, in-flight and post-flight. So that yeah. five stages, um, they all have their own requirements. And mm -hmm. I think to your point around post-event, post-flight, post-holiday, post-booking, whatever it might be, two-way interaction for real-time feedback. You know, when I used to work heavily in the call center world, we used to call that VOCA, which was voice of customer analytics. And mm -hmm. you know, now it's surveys, post-engagement post uh, scoring, all of that good stuff. Um, and the kind of modern term would be, you know, customer 360, where you actually understand everything about that life cycle and that, that, that full journey. So I think you're, you're right in that it's now as important because it's about being able to learn lessons quickly about anything that's gone well, promote it more, not gone so well, can you change it, gone badly, stem the bleeding. You know, we all know that social media now everybody buying anything goes online and they try and find something about whatever they're going to buy. They want a review. They want a report. They, and, you know, you don't look at something that's got uh, 80,000 five-star reviews or four and a half star reviews. You go onto the reviews and you click the one star one and you read the 18 bad comments because actually that tells you what could go wrong. And if it's all about the experience, and you still need the product, that's fine. But if it's about something that's fundamentally important to you and you see the same thing being the one-star review, that then starts to shape your behavior. So if you think about COVID and the fear that's gone into the masses and the uncertainty around what happens if you're in a destination that then enters quarantine or air bridges close or somebody in your party tests positive, you might get the test and trace alert that somebody you were around a week earlier is just tested positive and you're now on holiday. What does that look like? So, yes, I think the ability to, 
to stay engaged with your customers and get that real-time feedback so you can always be the best version of yourself is absolutely key to, to any company's survival in the, the new post-pandemic world. Cool. Thank you very much. Um, the next question, uh, regarding work from home for tech professionals, uh, can tactical work get done in these current times or is there a way to make innovation and collaboration possible? Oh, good question. Um, yes and yes. Um, so working from home, you've got to be able to do what you did before because for the last year, that's what we've had no choice in doing. And, you know, I, I work for Oracle, one of the biggest tech companies in the world. We've grown during the, this time because as people are moving away and, and being remote-based, They've got to have access to SaaS-based technology. They've got to have access to, to their, their business systems. So you know, companies like ourselves have, have grown and helped customers throughout that time. Now, as a result, people can work from home and systems have had to change. You know, They reckon we've had seven years of digital transformation happen in four months at the start of the pandemic, and we're now getting that. But I, a lot of the companies that I've engaged with and spoken to they ha I don't personally think it's digital transformation that they've gone through in the last year. I think it's remote capabilities they've gone through. Mm -hmm. They've kept all of the processes pretty much the same, and all they've done is make things browser-based so that it can be accessed remotely. Um, and that's not really transformation or digital transformation. That's just remote capabilities. But what it's done is it's shown that people are able to work remotely and work well. And they probably like the work-life balance that that's created. Now, in some cases, it's had to, to be that work-life balance because of homeschooling and, and, and all that kind of uh, environments that we're having to deal with and, and everyday challenges. But what it's also done is it's made people realize just how important that office culture is and that ability to be with people. So if I look at a big digital transformation engagement that I would be involved in, typically that could be five to 10 workshops. It could be um all manner of meetings there might be phases in the program if it's a three-year transformation program you know you could easily have 50 to 60 meetings throughout that three-year period of anything from one to one to you know one to many workshops now i think what you will start to see as companies either move to smaller office space or they have more remote working and particularly where they have people working in different parts of the country or different countries, I think you'll have far more virtual meetings taking place and then you will have significant come together meetings uh, that could be tied around industry events or they could be tied around other things happening in your company. But I think that they will become more precious and they'll become more valuable and they'll become of a higher value to everyone involved because as social creatures, we need to be around each other. We need to be around people and we need to have that small talk. Um, you know, at the moment, we've, we've got this time together on, on Zoom and we're talking about some great stuff, but we scheduled a time slot. We get on the time slot, we talk about the, the things we're going to talk about for this, and then you know we, we part ways. Whereas in the older style of doing things, we'd have met, we'd have had coffee, we'd have had a lot of small talk, we'd have built that that one-to-one -one rapport, and then gone into this where we talk about the industry and we talk about the challenges facing it. And then at the end of this meeting, uh, we would still have time for small talk. So I think what's yeah. missing with these new digital-only engagements is the human touch, the personalization, the, the small talk, which ultimately can, can shape the way you do things because through that small talk, you will highlight a couple of things that just trigger something and you think about it and you, and you have a, a, a conversation on the way to the lift, to the elevator. You, 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 you're going to the same destination, so you get a taxi together or you get on the, the, the underground together and you get that 10 minutes of just, you know, talking about various different things which actually are what build relationships because in the modern technology world most companies have similar products 
And they do probably 80 to 90% of the same thing as some of their competitors do. But it's that 10, 15, 20% differentiator that makes them buy Oracle over someone else or buy somebody else over someone else. And it's very difficult to actually understand what that nuance is if you don't understand the people and the culture and the, 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 the important things to them that they're really trying to achieve that you don't necessarily get in that formal engagement. So I think that's where, yes, you can, but I do think something will be lost. And I think that we do need to have a hybrid environment um, of remote working for efficiency. So let's have a 15 minute catch up, make sure everybody's on, on point with the project on the deliverables. And then, uh, you know, summaries, engagement, bring people together, do these presentations. But I do think that we need to get back to having face-to-face -face engagement as well. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I think uh, very true. All right. Uh, moving on to the next question. Uh, conversational intelligence and chatbots um, are a huge benefit in a variety of industries. Uh, but what do you think is the current state uh, of their adoption in aviation industry per se? Um, so... I think that there's a lot of chatbots in the industry. Hmm. I think there's a huge number of them. And I think a lot of them that exist at the moment are at best poor because they do one thing and they, they're if this, then that chatbots. They're not, they're not digital assistants. They're not conversational. They are static and normally out of date as soon as they're deployed. And if you think about what a chatbot does or a digital assistant does, it's about routine, repetitive answers or direction or guidance. And the idea of deploying it is not because you want to give a negative experience to your customer. It's because you want to give them access to the information, question, query, problem or concern that they have as quickly as possible on their device without them having to spend time in a queue calling someone or going somewhere. So it's yeah. meant to be about efficiency for the customer. It's not meant to be about cost cutting only for the company. Mm -hmm. And as a result, when they got deployed, it was, well, we're getting a hundred questions an hour of the same thing. So we'll put a chatbot on that does that thing. But if people then ask the question in a slightly different way, they either got an answer that made no sense or they, they didn't get it. So they'd have to e elevate that up to a phone call or a video call or a face-to-face -face in, in engagement to get the answer. And by that point, they're frustrated because it hasn't worked. So I think that the, the modern digital assistant, it has to have that conversational capability, that AI-infused element, because it's got to be able to almost do a fuzzy match. So if, if I type in, uh, you know, I have a problem with X and somebody else said X is causing me a problem and somebody else said I can't seem to find the answer to X. We're all asking the same thing, but we're asking it in three totally different ways. And if you go to different parts of a country, then not only would they be getting asked in those three separate ways, they might be using local words that they know exactly what it means but the system doesn't. So you need to have the ability for those systems to understand what the intent is that's being asked. Yeah. And you need to have the capability for it to be updated, to constantly evolve and become able to give answers at the right time on the right device. And I think if companies were to invest more in AI-infused autonomous self-service, and conversational intelligence and you know full automated digital assistance then the results would actually pay for themselves many times over because they get better over time the more people use them the better they get so actually not only does the efficiency go up your customers are getting the answers that they want as quickly as possible and if you think about the next elevation, it's not necessarily about conversation. I want to ask my Alexa speaker or my Google Assistant speaker or Siri uh, a question and get the answer. It's the fact that I may want to do that, but I may want to do it through my 
uh, app on my mobile phone. So if you think about travel, you know, I've got the app, I've got my boarding pass on it. I might be getting real time offers and so on going to it. But you know what it's like, you're, you're getting ready to go out the door, you're sorting out the kids, you're, you're making sure your luggage is all there, you're, where's the passports, all that kind of stuff. The ability to say, hey, Alexa, is my flight still on time? And it then says, yes, it is. And it's not just on time, it's doing this, it's doing that. There's a delay. If I can have an alert come through my, my smart speaker or my mobile phone that said uh, traffic's really bad, and you know your flight's in three hours or four hours, and it's a it's normally an hour's journey to the airport, but it's looking like it could be two hours. You want to get going now, and the ability that I'm now driving, and I want to keep that update, keep getting that information, so I can then do the conversational AI through my smart assistant on my phone, or or, or you know again through Alexa, through Siri, through uh, Google Assistant, through Cortana, through anything, and not just the ones that exist today, but the ones that are coming tomorrow or coming the next day. And as the apps collapse and there's this big movement now to these new super apps that, that do it all, then conversational intelligence is going to become absolutely, well, that conversational UI is going to become far more important. All right. Thank you. Uh, moving on to the next question. So data is crucial for the survival of the aviation industry. And uh, so what do you think, what, what will be the future capabilities that we will see with AI and technology? Data is the future. Um, well, data is the new gold. You know, it's the most valuable commodity we have um, in any company because it's, it's very hard to predict where to invest your corporate money at the moment, particularly if it's, if it's finite, if it's limited. You've got to get the biggest bang for your buck. And how do you make that decision? What is the, the guiding factor? It's looking at the data, right? It's saying, we've got, we think this, now let's look at the data and make sure that it backs that up. So that's about business data. But then you've also got your user data, you've got the historic data, you've got the trends, and you've got everything that goes with that. So I think that, Companies, particularly in aviation, there's no shortage of data that they have. What is missing is the ability to actually make the data make sense and make it usable and get it to highlight trends and get it to actually become a value-based commodity rather than something you have because it's compliance. And I think that AI, being able to sift through that and then highlight things, that's going to be huge. I think that even just little things like duplication is a problem. You know, if I get five emails for the same thing because they've got me as Murray Grubb Jr., Mr. Murray Grubb Jr., Mr. M. Grubb Jr., Mr. M. Grubb, M. Grubb, they're all me. And one of them might be tied to my business profile. One of them might be tied to my personal profile, but they're all me. And if I get the same advert or the same campaign or the same experience across all of those, then it shows that I am a number. I'm not a name. I'm not a person. And in the new world, everybody wants to feel a little bit more special than that. We want to feel that we are not a commodity buyer. We are somebody that a company wants to have a relationship with. I want to fly from here to there, and there's 10 airlines that do it. Well, why would I pick your airline? I pick your airline because either it's cost effective to use yours or because it's the one that makes me feel special. And if the cost is comparable across all of them, the one that makes me feel special or has a reputation for making me feel special, or has a reputation for making other people I care about feel special, well, that's the one I'm gonna go with. But how do they get to actually form that relationship with me if I've never used them before? They need to have accurate data. They need to have the, the ability to personalize an outcome or an event based on that data. And they need all the time to make me feel special. 
And then once they've actually got me on the hook, whether that is in that research, booking, pre-flight, in-flight or post-flight phase, they've got to be able to then use that data and that historic data to keep giving me that level of love that I now expect from them. And they've got to be able to, to do that almost instantly. If I go on their website, I don't want to have to put all my details in again and start my search again. I want the ability for it to pick up where I was. If I then elevate that to a, a digital assistant and I'm asking it questions, I want it to have an idea about what I'm asking it so that it's already got the stuff being created in the background that I might need access to. If it already thinks that it's going to be complex because it's watched my, my heat map, my digital journey, and it says, actually, this is going to have to go straight to an agent. Or it could be that you've got lots of agents available at that point in time. So you might want to give me that, that experience of a, a, a live agent straight away instead of a digital assistant because I'm a, a high value customer or I'm a high complexity customer or I'm a customer with learning difficulties or special needs. So it makes sense to put me to it. And all of that can be flagged because of your data, both historic and user and accurate data. So... I think that data is going to be crucial to the survival of the industry. And I think that data can no longer just be taken for granted and collected en masse. You know, the new post cookie world that we're, that we're moving into, you know, you can't just leave a pixel on somebody's uh, screen and understand everything that they do. You've now got to take first and second party data, any of that third party data that you've bought in, you've got to aggregate it together. You've got to really start to understand your customers. And that isn't going to be quick, easy, or necessarily uh, low cost, but it is going to all of those things result in high value engagements. And high value engagements result in repeat business. They result in you know increased customer and brand advocacy and they increase loyalty. So that's why I think, yeah, you're right. It's going to be it's going to be absolutely crucial for the brand survival, not aviation. People are always going to fly. And if one brand disappears, another one will start up or it will collapse into another one. So I don't think aviation itself is going anywhere, but I think that we will see some shuffle of brands and I think we'll see some more mergers happening and some acquisitions happening. Cool. Um, just a quick question on that. So I think for personalization, right? I think there's always a hindrance and that is privacy. Yep. Right. I mean, in this digital age uh, where we want to stitch uh, user profiles across, whether it's a business profile versus a personal profile and so on. For so that, uh, a lot of uh, users or consumers may not be willing to share their data or may be unhappy about, um, about it. What, what do you think about that? So that is the black mirror moment. I think people are fed up sharing their data because they know that you get a value out of it. The companies get a value from their data. If they get nothing from it, then that's a one-way street. I don't want to give you access to my data if there's nothing in it for me. Um, and I think people are more and more aware of that now. I think that people realize that data helps companies massively. If you look at the four biggest value companies in the world, they're worth more than countries entire gdps and they're worth that because they understand data and they understand how to use data and they've created graphs of user you know a, an average company has about 43 different data points on an individual mm -hmm. versus facebook and google and companies like that that have hundreds of thousands of touch points on you they understand everything about you so they can absolutely personalize something to you now if that's what they're doing and they're becoming these you know, mega companies, well, individual companies need to, to take a leaf out of their book and say, right, we've got this data. What's in it for the customer? Well, we don't just want to keep collecting it. We've got to make it real. We've got to actually say, right, now we know you and we know what makes you tick. Let us help you. Let's start to create these rock star services. Let's, let's make every single person feel special for the whole time they're engaging with our brand so that they don't just enjoy it, they will do it again and they'll tell everyone else. A happy customer tells two, an angry customer tells 10. So we need as many happy customers as we can get. And 
if you think about it in that way, um, I do think that companies need to be a bit more upfront with mm-hmm. why they capture data and what it does. You know, you, you see cookies now and it says, do you want to accept the functional cookies to make the site work? Or do you want to give them access to all your marketing information so that they can use it and make money off it? Well, again, there's no incentive to, to, to necessarily the user to do that. But if they were to turn around and say, um, we want to build a relationship with you. And if you agree to, to share this data with us, then we'll give you a discount or we'll, we'll enter you into something or we'll do something. You know, And, and they're, they're up front. Yes, we're going to use it, but this is what's in it for you. I think we'll start to move more to that. And I think that that's actually probably going to come a lot quicker than people realize. It's going, to, it's going to almost be demanded. It's going to be, I'm not giving you anything unless I'm getting something in return. And that quid pro quo of data versus value, I think is going to have to be accelerated because people now, they are, everything's the first time. You know, they've not, they've not got those historic memories. They've got historic memories of where they went. They don't really have historic memories now of how they felt while they were going there. And there's this blurring of the lines now between the airport experience and the airline experience. I deal with the airline in that research phase, the pre-flight stage, all the information that comes. Then I go to the airport and you know the airport can make or break my encounter of that travel. I could get on the plane, which is the first time I'm actually going to be encountering anybody who works for the airline. Um, but I'm angry because I've had a bad airport experience. So the airline's now got to put up with me feeling bad and anything that goes with that. And then when I land where I'm going, the airline might have had to take out all my frustrations for you know, a long haul flight. And they've, they've got an uphill battle just to get me back to a point of neutrality. So I'm then less likely to say how great they were because I had a bad experience beforehand. Or conversely, I might have had a really bad experience with the airline leading up to that point. I get to the airport and then the airport experience is phenomenal. And I have a great time. I feel really relaxed. And then get onto the plane. I'm in a great frame of mind. And everybody can build together. So I do think that this, this linking of the airport experience and the airline experience is coming together. But I think that the whole journey now is starting to get viewed holistically. And I also think that that will then shape where people choose to go. Because they'll choose to use particular airlines that can go somewhere they want to go. Mm-hmm. And if they want to go somewhere hot and sunny, there's lots of airlines that go somewhere hot and sunny. If there's a particular destination, that might narrow it down. But I think if you start to see that particular airlines are really easy to deal with, you always get great value and you always get a great experience. Certain airports are really great places to be. It's seamless to get there. It's easy to get there. They're hyper clean. You feel safe. Um, Everybody's having a great time. Then you might start to see people picking destinations that allow them to use certain airlines and certain airports at both ends of the journey. And it's just as important on the return element as well um, for where they go. So I do think people are going to start doing a lot more research. And I think you're going to see a lot more things like micro blogs where people are actually documenting their experiences and putting it out there because it's all new and they know people in their network are going to be interested. And then you might start to see people say, they look like they had a great time. That looked like a great airline. That looked like a great holiday. Looked like a great airport. All those things look great. I'll now contact them and say, who did you book it through? How did you book it? What did you pay? And I might replicate that myself. So I think actually these um, advocates and advocacy of the users are going to become ever more important. Cool. I think great insights. Uh, Thank you. One last question. Uh, Do you have any other thoughts that you would like to leave our audience with? Uh, Any other thoughts? The biggest one I would leave everyone with is that it's coming back. You know, we all love being on holiday. We all love travel. Um, It's been a really difficult 12 to 18 months of uh, not being able to do that and and not doing it in the way we want. And, you know, it's a case of bear with it because we don't want the airlines to to not survive. You know, these companies were part and parcel of our, our lives and certainly, you know, things that I've enjoyed doing. So if you are interested in going on holiday again, then book it and, you know, book it with an airline that's going to look after you and make you feel safe in that booking. 
and yeah, get let's get back to uh, to enjoying the aviation space as quickly as as possible. Yep, that that's really a great advice. I'm looking forward to travel as well. Um, thank you so much, Murray, for giving us your time. Uh, your insights were really valuable, and I know our audience is really going to enjoy this interview. We'll be back with a new episode uh, with a brand new expert soon. So stay tuned, and we'll see you around for the next one. Thank you very much.